today we are having the second uh, panel, civil society maneuver areas. We're going to have Metin Bakkalcı from Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, Goran Miletic from Civil Rights Defenders, and Feray Salman from the Human Rights Joint Platform. And our moderator uh, will be our uh, distinguished professor who always uh, supports us, Mr. Ahmet Insal, journalist and academic, and I'll give the floor to you with that. Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Well, you just said that the first panel, uh, panel in these series of uh, panels was about services and rights-based approaches. And in the second panel, we will talk about the fields of activities for the civil society, the maneuver areas where uh, the civil society can expand and where it stagnates, actually, in some societies, unfortunately, or even regresses in uh, certain fields. We will talk about the duties, the responsibilities of the civil society. So we will be exchanging our ideas and experiences together. Well, I say together, but it will be mainly our speakers who will be uh, discussing these uh, topics. We will be listening to their opinions and ideas about these topics. And then uh, we will try to continue with your questions. As you know, the civil society concept became uh, more visible after the 1980s in Turkey and starting from the 1990s it became a global social uh, fact or phenomenon. Uh, we had important developments and progress. Unfortunately in the most recent times we are seeing a regression because of the political climate in Turkey and in some societies during the pandemic uh, similarly we have seen a regression in the civil society organizations so, in the Western societies, there is also a setback and people are questioning the interventions of the civil society in this field, discussing what else could be done. And on the other hand, some people see uh, civil society as part of politics. There is a, a movement. Uh, seeing uh, like this, uh, thinking that civil society and politics uh, are intertwined and go hand in hand. And so there is this dual uh, situation whereby on one hand we have civil society organizations carrying out activities uh, targeting only certain fields and those who think that this should be the case and then on the other hand we have those who think that civil society should mainly focus on political transformation and uh, it should be a rights-based approach so there is a duality uh, between these two approaches and this is reflected on the civil society organizations as well sometimes these two uh, schools uh, of thought uh, complement one another and sometimes they actually diverge from one another. So my first question is for Mr. Dr. Metin Bakalcı. As you know, a few months ago, he became the president of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey. So congratulations are in order, I guess. Thank you. So first question is that Uh, your foundation, the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, is part of the civil society in Turkey. And looking at the developments in Turkey, how does your organization position itself? Do you think you are more empowered, more powerful compared to the past, or vice versa? How do you define uh, the position, current position, and the future position of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey. 
Okay, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, during these uh, pandemic days, we are actually stuck with these Zoom or online meetings, but still we are uh, using these platforms to overcome the challenges of the pandemic because the, the life is not only about our homes, we need to be present everywhere outside our homes as well, especially in these dark days. And I hope uh, brighter days uh, will uh, come soon. So with your permission, in order to answer this question concretely, let me start by saying this, the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, looking at the uh, development of the recent history in Turkey, by the way, we can talk about different periods. We shouldn't be categorized these periods because they are intertwined. There is no clear distinction, but there are certain thresholds in terms of uh, this field and in terms of our foundation. So let me try to answer your question from that perspective. Of course, we had the military coup uh, of the 12th of September 1980 in Turkey. But looking at the more recent history in terms of the human rights movement, maybe we don't need to go into the conceptual discussions, but in terms of the civil society in general, which is your field of expertise, by the way, we can say that at all levels, that was a, an important threshold. The 1980 military coup in Turkey was the first threshold, uh, a breaking point. Uh, in Turkey, because it's also very much related to the history of our foundation as well. Right after the 1980 military coup, after a very short period of time, hundreds of thousands of people were tortured in Turkey. They were subject to torture, and uh, over the years, these people were released. And I personally also somehow served uh, in prison at that time. So. Uh, you uh, get damaged physically and psychologically and you need, of course, uh, remedies for that. And the health workers started to provide contribution to the healing process of the victims of torture. And that was an activity that was actually going on uh, in the personal lives of the torture victims in the first half of 1980s. In the second half of 1980s, all around the world also, not only in Turkey, uh, activities against torture became visible. There was a maturation process during that time. So this actually stemmed from the pain and sorrow of this country looking at our foundation, the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey's activities already had started as a network before we became uh, an entity as a foundation. We were uh, we needed to come together to regenerate information and knowledge. We made efforts, and I remember very clearly that many scientific studies uh, in Turkey and around the world in terms of the treatment of torture and documentation of torture started at that time, whereby we didn't have a legal entity as the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, but we already had the activities going on. And then the Turkish Medical Association and the Human Rights Association, which was established in 1986 as one of the first institutions in this field, started to focus specifically on uh, victims of torture and healing and treatment processes of the victims of torture. And yes, in 1990, officially the foundation was uh, established. That was the first uh, threshold. And of course, uh, the damage happens to the most to uh, those who really suffer it and health and healthcare was uh, very important but we had this process of healing that uh, was brought from a holistic approach and in terms of prevention of torture also we had some activities from day one on we want actually to have the purpose of seeing a day whereby we would 
not anymore need the activities of this foundation so that there would be no torture. Of course, we had violations of human rights in 1980s because of the Kurdish problem as well, and the state, the government wanted to become a part of the human rights uh, organizations. And at the international platform as well, specifically, we had more sensitive, so to speak, more uh, focused approaches on human rights. Uh, I'm talking about the 1990s. And what I'm trying to say is that, yes, human rights uh, foundation is already carrying out activities based on universal values. So we have a public uh, purpose in a way. We have our uh, own ideals, not for a designated group, but for everyone. We are working in line with universal values. So after the 1990s, starting with 2000s, between 2000 and 2004, on one hand, we had the state becoming more organized in the field of human rights. On the other hand, we had a more controlled civic space. So there was, in a way, a process of negotiation between the state and the civil society. We can define that period in Turkey like that. And in terms of our field of activity, many very valuable human rights institutions were formed and established at that time, focusing on specific themes and topics. And after 2004, a lot of data indicates that both in Turkey and around the world, maybe because of the implications of 9-11 uh, to Turkey as well, we had a negative uh, trend in the field of human rights, in the field of democracy in general. There was a negative uh, or a declining trend. Well, the data shows this, and our everyday work also shows this to us. Our relation with the authorities also show this, and the international mechanisms also show this. We had uh, signals of something coming negatively, the state being part of these fields. So public withdrawing fr uh, the state withdrawing from the public sphere and trying to be involved in the civic uh, space through projects or other uh, initiatives. That was the trend. And most importantly, uh, the space for negotiation was damaged. Maybe you would remember, we had the advisory board of human rights. I was part of that. And for instance, we prepared the report on cultural rights. And the president of that advisory board was Ibrahim Kabola at that time. And Baskun Oran was the head of the uh, cultural rights board. They were uh, litigated back in 2004. So they tried to oppress these spaces for negotiation after 2004 in Turkey. And most recently, in 2015, we started to see the uh, conflict arising again in Turkey and that conflict environment. And then the failed coup attempt of the 15th of July uh, 2016 in Turkey further uh, worsened things. So we still have the state of emergency that is actually going on uh, in, uh, in the in exercise, let's say, at, uh, at least. So the state of emergency turned uh, has turned into a lasting and continuous regime. And uh, bear in mind that almost half of the history of uh, the Republic of Turkey was spent with uh, extraordinary regimes, and the other half was spent uh, with non-official extraordinary regimes, state of emergency. So there's always uncertainty, militarism, uh, violence, securitization, practices were always prevalent. And most recently, even this uh, fight against the pandemic might turn into an issue of security. Imagine, under these circumstances, uh, we uh, are seeing uh, an environment whereby the violation of human rights is the practice and protection of rights becomes uh, rare. So in the 1990s, we were trying to prove that the rights were violated, but nowadays uh, we 
are actually going through a reconstruction uh, of a rights-based uh, regime. Individuals are uh, no longer agents, they don't have rights anymore. So you can become an individual with your rights, right? Human rights. So you are no longer an individual if you don't have uh, your rights. So we are seeing the examples of this everywhere. We are all witnessing many examples of this ourselves also. So in the public sphere, civic sphere, there is a great shrinkage. So they are shrinking the civic space and uh, destroying uh, the values, human rights values, and the international mechanisms, which I will be talking about in the second round, uh, those mechanisms are made dysfunctional. So we are really going through a real crisis. And that uh, intermediate space between the state and civil society, such as law, negotiation, they have been totally dissolved. And if we're talking about the human rights issue, because of its definition, the possible violator is the state. So what we're dealing with is the violations by the state. But now there is an interface. There is no longer an interface. So we are directly facing the state in front of us. With your permission, maybe at this point I can... Uh, okay, you have... Uh, a couple of more minutes left, then I will uh, ask the uh, same question to the other speakers, if you can wrap up for the first round. Okay, from our perspective, we can uh, say uh, that because of this repression or oppression in Turkey, we are try. We need the international mechanisms more. We uh, get. We need to get our strengths from the international mechanisms. But there is also problem regarding uh, other countries. So, what I want to say uh, as a last word is that during all this process, in this oppressive environment, first we are trying to do uh, what we do in a better way, and we are not. Uh, trying to withdraw uh, to ourselves, but we want to expand our field of activity based on the universal values. That's the target. And uh, I uh, have to say that we are taking steps uh, towards that purpose. We are expanding our field of activity by, of course, protecting our main uh, functions. We are building on uh, that uh, knowledge and experience. We are not trying to work in every field. So, with your permission, I will stop here. I would like to remind you that uh, we have to restrict our answers to 10 minutes. So, you can use only 10 minutes to answer the questions. This way, we can even distribute the limited time slot we have for the speakers. I would like to turn to Goran Milevich from Civil Rights Defender, Mr. Goran Miletic from Stockholm. As far as I know, he is in charge of Western Balkans, working as the program director for the Western Balkans. This is a very important initiative established in 1982. As Metin Bey, the previous speaker, was telling us about those years, 1980s, uh, those were the times when the civil society was under severe repression back then. So during those times in Stockholm, this important initiative was established, civil rights defenders, represented by Mr. Goran Miletic. We would like to turn to him with the following question. Considering civil society initiatives uh, since 1980s, uh, regarding their development since then. What could be said about the Western Balkans? Uh, I know you uh, were trained in Sarajevo and you are familiar with the Serbia issue. So how about the situation in the Western Balkans uh, and in Europe and globally? What is your take on the development of civil society movement since then? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, at the very beginning, I want to say a big thank you to interpreters who will, who hopefully will be able to translate me because I'm speaking quite fast often. Uh, 
I must say that, that before 80s, uh, not only in the Balkans, but in, in the whole Europe, we were always asking questions as a civil society, how we will follow implementation of international human rights standards, how we will be able to prove that countries will, are violating human rights and to press them uh, uh, to, to respect human rights standards. And then after 80s or, or nine, let's say 80s or 90s, uh, world became finally global. Everything became quite close. And uh, for example, wars that happened in the, in the Balkans uh, during the 90s uh, became a visible uh, a violation of human rights and uh, international uh, humanitarian law became visible to the whole world. This is something that never happened uh, happened before. So it was quite fast. Everything was easy to uh, to show. Everything was easy. It was easy, relatively easier to collect evidences and to present to the whole world. But what was important in that time? That time, it was important only to have facts, to collect evidences, to monitor, to collect evidences, and to establish facts. That was 80s maybe 90s, maybe even 2000. But what's happened today? What, what is the biggest change today? And I think that this pandemic is the last phase of the big change that we had in past, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years or so on. The populism is the is the key the key change that we have in our in our world. Uh, that what that what we have in the Balkans. That what we have even in Europe. You have Hungary, Poland. You know also the good thing. It's not only populist movement. It's it's uh, or political uh, parties. It's it's also the case what what is connected to that. The first thing that was uh, that was uh, a victim of the of those populism is actually truth. Are the facts that we were always collecting. So it was our job was quite simple before. We collect some facts, we present report, and then people based on report, they formulate opinion and they know what's happened. But now uh, uh, populists is misusing facts or they are or they are presenting fake information or they are simply producing some narrative that has no connection with the facts or has a connection with very few facts. So this is a biggest change for uh, for us who are working uh, both in the Balkans, but in Europe, uh, for you guys and for, for everyone around the globe, even in the United States, I mean, who was a kind of leader, uh, leader before. So uh, that's the first thing. Second is rhetoric that is uh, far, far wing rhetoric became quite strong before that rhetoric was quite, uh, let's say, uh, 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 it, it was uh, it was not that visible. It was small, and it was somewhere on on the on some small parts of society was really far right. And we were even sometimes laughing at those guys. We we're saying, "Well, you see, those guys, no one is listening to them. It's a small group of people." But those far wing uh, far wing uh, forces are now very very uh, stronger. Another phenomenon that's happened, and we are living right now. It's a digital tool. Everything is digital now. At the moment, even this meeting, I will. If you ask me five years ago, five years ago, is it possible to have such meeting or such a conference? I mean, online, I, I will always say no. It's not possible to have a big and important event online. But here we are. For for a year, we are doing that. Civil society is stronger, initially stronger than government when it comes to digital or internet world. We are stronger, but sometimes government is trying. Not sometimes, often is trying to obstruct to obstruct that and uh, regressive forces and populist forces is, is trying to do, uh, to, do, uh, to, to do the opposite and to obstruct our advantage. And another thing that is also important, uh, instead of facts and truth, emotions became a key. In social media, everything is now, is not to write that, you know, 15 people were beaten on the street. It is everything is emotion. It's emotional story of one person. What's happened to one one person? And I think that human rights organization realized this. Uh, uh, this it is a problem actually for us uh, uh, since five years or maybe ten years ago that everything became very emotional and it's very easy sometimes for some organization to pass 
the line when things are not truth, when you put a lot of proverbs and not just focus uh, uh, focus on fact. And there is a lot of simplification uh, uh, that is that is happening during these days. So you cannot be in your report detailed as you were in nine in eighties or nineties. When you read some report uh, that time, some very big reports and so on. Uh, young generations are not are not interested often to read reports uh, uh, that are not, that are now produced by human rights organizations. They want just summaries summaries of those reports. So as you can see, context of our work change not only in the Balkans. I think change globally, change everywhere in every country around the globe. Things change, and I think pandemic was the last thing uh, last thing to uh, to change. However, there is a lot of advantages. Of course, street protests you can organize much easier. You can you can uh, formulate demands that you will you know one group of people can formulate very easily some action and what they will do, how they will react. That's good. That's something positive. But that's not enough. Uh, that's not enough, and uh, these reactions are not something uh, uh, that will be how to say that will that will lead the whole process of changes uh, in the future uh, we are still trying to find the civil society ways how to adjust and what to do how to which kind of relation to have to the government because government is uh, is trying much more than before to have gongos to have their own organizations and to obstruct the work of civil society is doing that's what we have in the balkans that's what we have in Europe, but I guess that you can also have the, uh, the similar experiences. But I think that all those things that I mentioned, digital area, populism, uh, firing, emotions, those are some things where we as a civil society are working uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Miletic. What a valuable assessment you have uh, given us. Thank you. It was quite interesting. It was a very good summary of the current situation. While listening to you, we continue to get further questions and views that are quite relevant to the points you have made in your intervention. While speaking to you, I'm also trying to scan through those. And we will be wrapping them up before the end of the session. Now, I, will, I would like to move on with Ms. Ferai Salman from Human Rights Joint Platform. She is working as the coordinator in the joint platform, which was established in 2005. It was, as it was said, one of the uh, watershed moments in the history of civil society movements in Turkey. As far as I remember, it was uh, it started as a joint project of five associations, Muslim, their Helsinki Citizens Associations, Turkey's Human Rights Foundation, uh, International, Amnesty International, Turkey Office came together, started this joint initiative, and that is still working actively in the field of civil society. And you are the coordinator. It's over to you. Thank you very much for organizing such important meetings. I'd like to thank Hrant Dink Foundation. This is a very, very relevant topic these days. Uh, as we speak now, the parliament in Turkey is holding a parliamentary debate on a, a law, draft law, that is going to influence the civil society in Turkey immensely. Maybe that will be the last blow, or probably the last, not last blow. There have been a series of blows, uh, unfortunately. Before I go ahead, I'd like to make a little correction. This is human, not this is not human rights joint project. This is a human rights joint platform. No, no, no hard feelings. Just a small correction. I just try to prevent any misunderstanding. This is a joint platform. Well, of course, anything could be considered as a project, right? In that sense, what you said is correct. Whereas. Uh, 
Our platform is called Human Rights Joint Platform. So it's not a project. I just wanted to make this minor correction because project reminds one of an initiative uh, valid for a limited period of time, whereas ours is not something like that. This joint platform was the ideal owned by many civil society organizations, and so this came to life in 2005. It coincides with some critical moments in Turkey, 2005. It's one of the milestones in Turkish history because Turkey was uh, uh, has become a part of the opening process referring to a candidacy to the EU uh, regarding the EU accession process. And around those times, our platform, joint platform was established, and this remains one of our key agenda items. Whereas in general terms, this is not just what we do. Before this platform was established, back in 1990s, as it was very well summarized. Uh, back in 1990s, we all agree that those were the critical times for Turkey, also internationally, with respect to the civil society. Becoming more international, opening up internationally. On the one hand, there were authoritarian regimes. Uh, on the other hand, democratic institutions were flourishing. Human rights organizations were reshaping themselves back then. 1992, as far as I remember, 1992, World Human Rights Conference was a watershed moment. There were such important human rights mechanisms with increased presence of civil society with very important consequences. Habitat, likewise, uh, followed that. So this increased the diversity in the civil society back then and made civil society stronger. But at the same time, in such countries as Turkey, we should also say back then uh, more than two-thirds of the population was living under state of emergency conditions and civil society had to set up uh, solidarity networks to stand on its own feet under difficult conditions when you think of Helsinki Citizens Association while the intercity brotherhood sisterhood issue was an important one, there were serious repression as a continuation of 1980. Anti-terror law entered into force in 1991, and it was very repressive. So those were the times when the civil society was trying hard to stand on its own feet, build its own base, in difficult conditions. And I should also refer to the Kurdish issue. We tried to set up brother and sister cities. We tried to make the voice of the civil society heard. We tried to come together. The civil society tried to intervene and started to build a strength. In that sense, it's a great experience to set this joint platform up based on the experiences we acquired from the past. This also refers to the accession process of Turkey, candidacy of Turkey to the EU, and harmonization with the EU key democratization packages that entered into force. This influenced all of us. We were trying to make sure we have a better livable life. So this is how we try to collectively intervene in this process through the joint platform. So we've been active in this platform for the past 16, 17 years. And political scene in Turkey has changed. In 2010, Muslim Bar Association 
uh, has become an important, uh, became an important actor, and they withdrew from the joint platform back then. And the process continued at the same time. Turkey had some problematic areas from our viewpoint. I mean, from the perspective of human rights, with my human rights association background, I should say, uh, civil society's willingness to raise a joint voice was possible until 2009. We had such a space to coexist and raise our voice together until 2009. Turkey had some problematic areas and fundamental problems. We still have. For example, anti-discrimination and equality law, draft law. A hundred civil society organizations were mobilized by our joint platform to contribute to this law, draft law. Working together, mobilization, we were trying to strengthen this practice. We came up with a proposal, law proposal, and it was uh, crept and cropped here and there, and a, a part of that is reflected in the main law. But the, the law as it is now it doesn't have much to do with the proposal we originally came up with. Anyways, in 2013, you know, the breakout of Gezi protests, 2015 was an inter, another important date. Curfew was announced and 2016 was the year of state of emergency between 2016 and 18 people 130,000 people were officially suspended and so many uh, were also suspended but it was not officially declared so this is totally against law more than 1,400 civil society organizations oh yes they were organizations regardless of who they are who they were that's another uh, question but some of them were human rights defenders. So many of them were closed. So many organizations were closed. And trustees were appointed to municipalities afterwards. Such an extraordinary practice has become a routine. And this suffocated the civil society immensely. Until then, things were considered to be more normal. We thought we had the space to breathe, but then it turned out it was not the case. Then came 2018. Since 2018, ever-growing authoritarian regimes, which has become even stronger and stronger. It started to become an established practice. By the way, I'm hopeful. I'm not at all uh, in favor of giving up, no. But one needs to understand. Sure, I'll wrap up. Excuse me. Uh, were you saying something? Is the time up? Yes, just one last minute. I think uh, accidentally a listener turned on the microphone. Okay, I will wrap up in one minute. One other thing that influences us uh, is September 11. After the September 11 case, the global atmosphere was dominated by security policies. And the reflection in Turkey is quite obvious. At the end of 2020, I think I thought that was the last drop in the bucket, but it turned out it was not the case. That was even worse. Financial action force. You know, there is such an action force relating to the security policies of the UN 
they came up with some recommendations and because of their recommendations also due to other reasons uh, civil society was in a sense driven to a corner such a severe inspection was imposed on the civil society because of those recommendations this is what is happening at the moment from the viewpoint of the human rights joint platform we are all trying to enlarge our space trying to come up with tools that will help us to enlarge that space I think I need to stop here and we will continue later. One last thing, with your permission. This is what is happening at the moment. And some associations describe, some civil society organizations describe themselves as organizations based on rights. Some are giving out donations. We have a big problem of refugees in Turkey. Some organizations, especially in the field of human rights, are faced with dire situations. So we need to understand that. And we have to maintain what we have in our hands and we have to enlarge that space. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Feray Salman. The second question actually relates to that. The boundaries, problems, limitations for the future, we want to dwell on these. Unfortunately, in Turkey, most recently, it's never possible to say that, oh, we have seen the worst, because there is always something even uh, worse. It can even get uh, much worse. And that, of course, should not lead to pessimism and totally giving up. So we need to take action as well. So let me turn to Mr. Metin as well. Please uh, answer this question in eight to ten minutes. We have actually drawn uh, or giving you a snapshot of uh, Turkey and Goran Miletic also talked about the international experience, uh, the boundaries uh, he defined. And on a more concrete level, as a civil society organization, I mean, representing, you're representing Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, what do you think about the relations with the donors, uh, the, the organizations that provide the funds, the donor organizations and your relations with the beneficiaries of your services. Can you please make an assessment of your relations with these two uh, bodies, with the donor organizations and the people you provide services to? How things are changing and evolving in terms of your roles, responsibilities and boundaries? The speaker is muted. Yes, Mr. Metin, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Yes, in terms of responsibilities, because this is also uh, the topic of the panel, duties and responsibilities. First of all, I will talk about the experience of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, of course. If we're talking about human rights, then there is already a, a main paradox, a main problem because in terms of protecting uh, and strengthening human rights, it's directly the duty of the governments, the states. They have the responsibility to promote and protect human rights. But if we're talking about human rights violations, then again, the potential offender, the violator, is the state who needs to protect and promote these very rights. So that is actually a process that has marked uh, itself on the entire entirety of our activities. State on one hand is the protector, and on the other hand, it's the violator, the offender as well. So to put it in another way, how can uh, a violator be a 
protector or promoter as well. That is the dilemma. Well, I won't go into the details, but to overcome this dilemma, we need uh, effective and efficient participation and engagement of the society. Well, we are active agents and individuals in this society. We are not passive uh, people. If there is a violation, then we have a relation that is not only limited between the violator and the victim. If we liberalize everything, of course, violations will increase. If we are actively involved and engaged, then the violations will decline. So, again, speaking of the government or the state, these people are actually fulfilling uh, the duties assigned by us, by the society. So it's the society that assigns those the duties to uh, the officials, and we also have to give certain responsibilities to them. Those responsibilities are the following. For instance, we say for our safety and security, yes, maybe uh, you can impose certain restrictions on the liberties uh, and freedom of certain people, but you also have the obligation to protect their rights. So as the entire society, we also have another responsibility, which is to actively watchdog this entire process. So the result is that in terms of these uh, responsibilities, we need to take an active stance and be involved uh, actively. That's the implicit duty that we have. We as the human rights organizations, we have our duties, but at the end of the day, we have a person who is subject to a violation, be it torture or something else. So in terms of uh, finding a remedy uh, to compensate for the loss or the damage that person has incurred, we have to do certain things, just like uh, Goran has said, we watch these processes, document them, we make efforts so that they will be prevented and never happen again. And of course, as far as we have that space in between, that intermediate space I talked about, we can also have transformation. The human rights movement appeals to policies as well. So uh, that interaction between the political sphere and the civil uh, sphere might be a discussion for another event maybe, but we have to also keep that in mind. A third dimension is that. As of today, let's speak about what's happening more recently. If that, if there is a total crackdown on the civic space, and then we can say that the civil society organizations need to assume another function, which is a function of transformation. By the way, the human rights movement is a transformative uh, movement. By the way, rights also transform. They are not stable and stagnant, uh, universally speaking, they also need to transform. So the human rights movement needs to have this approach to reconstruct the public sphere. We also have that responsibility. That's what we discuss. That's what we uh, work for. And this is not important only for Turkey. This human rights crisis, if it's valid for the entire world, which we think it is, because I talked about the international mechanisms in the first round. I remember very clearly in the 1990s, in the beginning of 2000s, we saw the international institutions as an approval authority uh, for us to say that, yes, your rights are violated. But imagine the rights, the Roboski decision or the decision of the victims uh, of the events in Gizre, Think about those rulings or the other decisions after the state of emergency process. Now the repressive regimes are now in a way legitimizing themselves through these institutional mechanisms, international institutional mechanisms. They are turning into such mechanisms. So not only at the local level, but at the international level. Again, as mentioned by my colleagues, we need to, by the way, I'm wrapping up, uh, base ourselves on universal values and scientific knowledge to have solidarity and to, of course, intervene in everyday life actively. And we need to uh, use more creative ways. And 
this has been my ninth minute, so exactly I abided by my time because in the first round I took more of your time. I'm sorry for that, but let me uh, conclude here. Thank you. Thank you. Bu konuşmaları mükemmel. Yes, by the way, we would like to thank our interpreters who are doing a wonderful job. I was listening uh, to them. I was testing them, actually, if the interpreters were able to speak your fast uh, speech, but they are doing a wonderful job. They are doing it very well. So I tested the interpreters and I would like to thank them in advance uh, before closing. Okay, I also would like to apologize and thank the interpreters. No, no, they are doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Okay, Goran, I will turn to you, Goran Miletic. From your perspective, the civil society organizations and their experiences and their relations with the donor organizations, the funding organizations, how is it? By the way, it's a very important uh, function. Some of the civil society organizations also function as donor organizations, right? There is also a confusion over there, uh, internationally speaking. What are the, how do you see the relations between the CSOs and the funding agencies, organizations? Sometimes these funding uh, agencies provide opportunities and create dependency, maybe, right? So what is your take on this? What kind of new responsibilities does it bring and also new boundaries and borders or limitations? does it impose? I think that, that we need separate conference about this question, this, this question you asked me now, I mean, because I have really a lot of experiences. Uh, first, I was working with uh, regional, in regional uh, human rights organization, now I'm working organization that is really human rights organization in Sweden, but we're working globally, but we are also supporting local human rights defenders. So I, I think my, my key thing is always when, we, when I have such question, is that we are too much idealistic. We have too much expectations from the civil society or from human rights organization, and in the same time, too much expectations from the, from the donor organization. Uh, uh, first, what, what, is, what human rights organizations are not? First, human rights organizations are not states. Human rights organizations cannot exist in, instead of state. They, not, they cannot implement laws and human rights standards instead of state. So human rights organization or, or civil society organization is what it is. It's not the state. It cannot be uh, instead of state. It's also uh, uh, sometimes there are expectations that organizations can uh, do something instead of victims. Victims sometimes or citizens don't want to report human rights violations sometimes. Not sometimes, often they don't want. And we cannot press them. If they don't want, they don't want. So this is another thing, and there is expectation why you didn't do this, why didn't you do that. But sometimes victims or citizens uh, don't uh, don't want that. There is also uh, we are not political parties. We are not we are not uh, uh, dealing. You mentioned that in uh, in introduction, but I I'm, I think that human rights organization is, is not political. Political sphere is something uh, uh, is something different. Also, we are not dealing both human rights organization or civil society, and donors are not dealing with unlimited funds. So there is some kind of idea that there is some donor or there is some human rights organization who has unlimited money, that there, there is an organization in this world that can do anything anything he wants. I mean, basically, any there is no such, uh, such uh, human rights organization, civil society organization, or donor who has unlimited uh, amount of money. So everyone are making priorities. That's very, very important to understand. And also, when it comes to that, we are all always working under some security uh, or uh, security and uh, concern, concerns that always exist. And uh, the question, if we will have enough funds, uh, if we will have the funds tomorrow. So there is a lot of expectations in, in such one, both from human rights organization and from donor organization. And I must say that, um, uh, both organizations expect the donor are ideal. They understand what they are doing. And donors are expecting that organizations are, are always understanding what is their strategy, what are their priorities, and so on. And uh, interpretation is always the key. How donors interpret the work 
that organizations are doing with the field and how organizations of the field interpret what donors want, what donors need to achieve. Uh, also, there is a very big danger of, um, of how to say, simplification or, uh, or uh, prejudice when it comes to donor. Not all donors are the same. All donors, every donor is different. I cannot find two or three donors that are the same. Embassies are one, private donors, private foundations are similar, are different. Uh, then you have uh, local or regional foundations. Then you have uh, 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 some intermediary donors. You have a lot of different donors and they have different strategies and the diff different needs. So uh, from my perspective and from our perspective, the, the very close relations are, are the key of our work. We always have a core, core, uh, cl close relations to, to our partners on the field, everywhere where we work, but not all donors. That's us. But other donors have very distant relations. They are, you apply to some call, and then during the year you are sending to some person that never saw you, you are sending some reports or progress reports, and you never meet that. That on. Our idea is to meet our partners as, as much as possible and, and to provide something that is not only money, to, to be there, to be always there for our partners. So this is our logical fault. But many of our colleagues that I know are not like that. They just want to do it once a year and to meet partners once in three years, and that's completely uh, that's completely different. So it and also depends from country to country how don how donors work. So it is very very uh, it is very uh, different. Uh, responsibilities exist, responsibility exists, but unfortunately, again, I cannot generalize because you have from from the perspective when someone is donor you have a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, misuse of funds in different regions in different countries around the globe but in the same time you have uh, you have a, a, a lack of capacities within some organization to report and to provide uh, to provide good report so its situation is not that simple we like to simplify the situation. We would like to see all donors like the same and all human rights organizations, or civil society organizations like the same. But situation is not like that uh, in reality. Situation is quite human in both donor organization and human rights organization, civil society organization. Human beings are working and a lot depend on human beings. It can happen that very good organization became not that good over the night because people change and the same happened with donor organization. Some good person who understand the context, who understand the situation change, and then that donor organization is not maybe that good. So everything depends uh, Everything depend on people, uh, I think in both cases. And I think we need more under understanding and not to have uh, that idealistic uh, picture always in our in our head. So I think this is the this is the key responsibility uh, that we have. I can talk you more about uh, responsibility when it comes to reporting, to uh, financial things, or when it comes to from a donor perspective uh, to understand you know what are priorities and and so on. Uh, but I think this is too much for uh, uh, for such conference. So I think I should stop here. This is my ten minutes. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Goran Miletic. We also started to receive some questions from the audience. Mr. Insel is muted. We are not able to hear him. I'm sorry, he says. Yes, we will be receiving uh, some questions, so maybe we can uh, further expand the discussion concretely. We are receiving some questions from the uh, audience about the positions of the people working at the human rights organizations. Now I will turn to Human Rights Joint Platform. So you also gave me a lot of food for thought by correcting uh, me. Yes, uh, Ms. Ferai, I will ask the same question to you as well, based on your own experience, because you actually act as a coordinator, right? Your platform is a coordinator. 
uh, as well. So we're not talking about the activities of one single association or institution, but many different organizations, uh, which is an entire uh, different experience in itself. We are not familiar with that. So normally civil society organizations define themselves with the activities that they carry out. So this gives you uh, a wider perspective, I think, being a platform. So in that framework, can you talk about the duties, responsibilities, and in a broader sense, what are the new uh, challenges, not only in Turkey, but also around the world? This is a giant question that cannot be squeezed into 10 minutes. I will do my best to squeeze it into 10 minutes. You could call this a network or a coalition or a platform, whatever it is, whatever you call it, I want to refer to it. In Turkey, in order to claim the solution of a problem that hasn't been solved, there are groups that uh, come together, like for Roboski, uh, people come together to ask for a solution. And uh, Human Rights Joint Platform is such a, an example that came together to uh, try to find a solution to important problems. And this emerged as a response to a need, impunity, or problems encountered by the refugees. Those were some of the problems we wanted to tackle. We wanted to join forces. Joining forces is very important. And first of all, when you establish such platforms or joint efforts, different actors come together with no hierarchy no one is superior to the other one everyone has equal voice equal weight in this joint initiative and if you talk about the joint initiative everyone has to agree on it that is one and the since 2013, one platform that uh, emerged out of our platform is working against impunity. They specifically work in the field of impunity. Individuals and organizations come together against impunity. Another example is for refugee rights. This is a working group that turned into a network later on. These are autonomous structures and joint efforts. I believe we, uh, first of all, uphold important principles, jointly agreed principles. You need to, what we had to come together to jointly decide on those principles to uphold them in the first place. During the state of emergency, a member of our platform got closed down, but that didn't hamper our partnership. Uh, at that time, our member organizations were impacted. Some of them were arrested in the process. And we were trying to give an answer, give a reaction against those. And rather than giving individual responses, bring coming together, it makes a big difference because you can then give a joint uh, response. So one important thing is to stand against hierarchy, especially in the field of civil society. There shouldn't be any hierarchy. Everyone should have equal voice and say, and everyone's voice must be valued. And we should enjoy peaceful discussion areas. That's very important. These platforms need secretariat work, and 
I work for the Secretariat of this platform. The Secretariat works for all the members. And this is where we raise a joint voice. And we're trying to disseminate such a culture. I know we have shortcomings. And we're doing our best. And we know all the organizations who are a part of this questions themselves. They stretch their limits and uphold the principles, try to overcome their shortcomings. This is such an environment. So these are important with respect to our responsibilities, responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis our members and the entire human rights movement. As Metin said, human rights organizations and rights-based organizations, by the way, these days, lots of people claim they are rights-based organizations, but not all of them are. Uh, I'm referring to the real ones, and the real ones have an important duty to uh, cause change and drive the change. This is very valuable in Turkey. We should concentrate mostly on this item. We should change. And it's a responsibility of us. We should create change. We need to be questioning this and implementing it. I am aware that we do have shortcomings, though. I want to move to the financing aspect. In Turkey, this deserves a long debate, but uh, regarding participation, uh, I'm sorry, regarding accession of Turkey to the EU, we had to go through this preparation uh, and the highlight was the IPA structural funds aimed at transforming Turkey. But in the distribution of the funds, something important happened that still influences our today. These funds mostly were channeled to the public institutions. I'm not saying civil society was not uh, given support, but mostly the funds were channeled to the public institutions. For example, the Minister of Family and Social Policies, Ministry of Energy uh, were given the funds. And as a part of that transfer, a subcategory was transferred as grants to civil society. This is an important distinction. We need to discern uh, the difference here. This created some problems. We had to set up some operational cooperations among civil society organizations, but this caused some problems. For example, unless you are given an approval, you cannot uh, bring an issue to the attention of public institutions. As Mr. Miletic uh, mentioned, we want to reveal uh, fundamental problems. We want to uh, bring it before the eyes of the public to ask for its solution. And our role is to find a way out. And that is why we enter into solidarity with each other. But it, during this accession process, let's say for the past 15 years, civil society organizations were given only a subcategory of the funds transferred by the EU. And the civil society, uh, as we mean here, act as agents. They're not large in numbers, but in the field, as the drivers of change, we do talk about agents, agents of change, and it is very important for the funds to reach the end beneficiaries. We need to consider what influence they create on the lives of people, mostly in Turkey, unfortunately. Uh, these efforts are not followed up with impact analysis. We don't know the outcome of the transfers. 
what kind of a transformation the civil society has gone through, it remains uh, uncertain. As to the rest of this issue, well, I should say the legislation limits us. We have such a limiting uh, law on associations, very restrictive. Many activities of the civil society are subject to approval. So the only way out is for civil society to get foreign funds, external funds. By the way, when you think of the Minister of Interior, uh, the, the money, the fund is transferred to the General Directorate on Development of Civil Society under the Minister of Interior. Well, for the rights and freedoms, for the sake of change. In order to preserve the rights and freedoms, in order to ensure equal access to services and rights, we need resources. How about access to those resources? The government has restrictive policies, and actually there is a huge gap between the public institutions who have uh, access to those funds and the gap between them and the civil society who are the agents in this field. Thank you very much for this important analysis. Very important points you've made, especially for Turkey, where we talk about an ever stronger authoritarian regime that uh, mechanically suffocates the civil society space. Civil rights are uh, under restriction. In the third phase, well, taking this into consideration, let's delve deeper into this issue. The, uh, this brings me to the following question I want to address Mitin Bey. Well, we talk about a group of social problems. Some are political problems. Some are political and social problems. They're intertwined, actually. And the, an aspect of the problem is about the political actors. These sometimes intersect. Sometimes political actors have direct influence on civil societies, especially if they uh, guide the activities of the civil society in their own favor. Civil society is considered as a part of the politics by some circles. Some circles see civil society completely as a tool for the politics. These are usually backed by the government. That is one on the one hand, and on the other hand, some circles consider autonomous actors guide the sphere of civil society. These are the two approaches, the two different approaches, and in between, sometimes there's a tension. And this tension influences, this uh, contradiction influences the end beneficiaries of civil society work. What is your take on this? Would you like to share with us your suggestions? Microphone is muted. I'd like to share with you my uh, personal views on this. I think we're getting close to the last part, so let me say I would like to turn to positive sides because I have been talking about the negative sides since the beginning. Now I'd like to turn to the positive aspects. Think of our daily lives. Individually, we are all influenced by what is happening around us, not just in Turkey, but globally. And these are all caused by humans. 
done by humans. Anything done by humans is a preventable thing. Please ponder on this for a while. Yes, so far we have made important efforts, although they're not enough. We haven't been enough. This doesn't mean what we will do in the future won't be enough. Okay, the, the situation is very restrictive, there is this and that, but this doesn't mean we cannot achieve it. So this is what I would like to say in the time given to me, the last part. What we are discussing deserves a long debate, but I'm not going to take too much time. First of all, it is very important for all circles to express themselves jointly together in an organized way. This is a part of their fundamental rights. People also can come together around some common interests. This is their freedom. This is obvious. And I wish they all uh, adopted a rights-based approach. To what extent this is happening? Well, that's a, another question. So there are such efforts in the field of human rights movements. And we need to discern the following thing. With respect to the human rights, we're not serving a special interest, a, a specific interest. This uh, problem has to do with public, public interest, regardless of any identities. Of course, all identities are important, valuable, but one cannot universalize identities. One can universalize values. Values can be universal in Turkey, and globally these values suffer significant damages. So let me come back to the initial sentence I uttered. Human rights uh, should be the fundamental starting point for all of us. This should be the case in the political areas in other areas, it should all be rights-based. There shouldn't be a tension in between. When we talk about human rights organizations, they are built on universal values and principles. We personally, we could be biased. Uh, yes, it could be debated. Uh, we are aware of this. But here we're basically talking about highlighting those universal principles and values. So the overarching value should be the human rights. This should be fortified. Otherwise, yes, we could have lots of uh, justifications, explanations. Yes, uh, the area is very restricted, very much restricted. Whether it be political, civilian, I think one cannot uh, put the whole responsibility on the shoulders of the human rights organizations. The civilian and public space is suffocated under significant restriction at this moment in time. Of course, this also influences human rights organizations. And this is not free of political influence. That's not possible, but some are closed down and this causes politicization. This is a risk, politicization risk. We need to consider that risk. 
and it's important to minimize the, these risks. And how can we do that? We need to have independent structures built on universal values and principles. That should be the way out. That is my take. And that is uh, why we would like to work toward that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. You already received some questions actually in the chat box. So I will refer the same question to Goran Miletic as well. So in the previous round, you said human rights organizations are not political organizations, right? Did I understand you correctly? So you said that. So some of the human rights organizations define themselves as uh, assistance organizations in the political field and some define themselves as active in the civil field. And this also shows that there is a different definition of civil society by different civil society organizations. So in this tension, let's say, we have the political space and the civil space, which is in conflict, which is conflicting, if we look at it that way, then civil society organizations and their responsibilities and boundaries, how do you assess them? Uh, how do you assess their responsibilities within this conflict? And is there a difference between different countries? Because every country has its own norms and traditions. So maybe we uh, will not be able to universalize it. Yeah, I think I think uh, there are many many type of organizations. I mean that that belong to civil society. So you have different theories, of course. But some some people say that uh, even religious organizations or sport organizations or many other associations belong to the civil society. So civil society is much wider. Human rights organizations are just one part of the of that civil society. And I think that uh, especially human rights organization must say. Uh, must stay impartial and far away from the uh, from the involvement in political life in one way. However, it is idealistic and it is completely wrong that believe that the human rights organization can be fully neutral in the society. Members of civil, uh, uh, civil society organization, human rights organization are human beings who belong to the society and we all belong to the society and we are we are part of the society so we cannot be 100 percent neutral and so on uh, so in let's say almost ideal societies like sweden where i'm sitting now uh what is happening here and i then i compare with the societies that are let's say transitional like turkey like balkans like even even some uh, uh, really really a lot of repressive more repressive societies in other parts of the world uh, um uh, here uh it's very clear you should not be uh, 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 how to say any in any way involved in political life you are doing your human rights work that's that's one thing and that's completely uh, that's completely clear however you are always sitting with political parties and asking them to do what you see that they should do in the country internally and outside the country that they should advocate human rights outside the country of course, with whom you are not sitting is the, the political parties that are not having human rights values in their program. So there is a Swedish Democrats here uh, who are anti-immigrant political party and who are not that happy with human rights. But of course, they, they are changing because it's not possible in such society to stay for long and not to respect human rights fully. So uh, despite the fact that political parties are quite different. So you are sitting in the same table with the uh, uh, with political parties here in Sweden, the question is: in which moment you are you are staying away from the table? In which moment in one society you are not talking to the government anymore? When is when is that moment? And for example, from my experience in the Balkans, it's very very hard. It's very hard because if you want to organize gay parade, I mean, you need to sit with the government because they can 
guarantee you security. In some other moments, when, when they are beating uh, the, the people who demonstrate, you cannot see the, them. They basically, because police officers commit torture. So it's very hard to have that moment, that line, when you are sitting with the government and in line when you're not sitting with the government officials anymore, because they violate, they violate human rights. So this is, the, this is the tricky part. It is not tricky part when you have an ideal world when human rights organizations are independent, like I have here in Sweden, and we are writing policies, and we are demanding from the government to do one, two, three, four, five. And government must do this because media are on our side, and media are pressing governments to do what we, as an expert organization, say that must be done in related to racism in Sweden, in relation to migration, in relation to discrimination, and so on. This is a bit ideal world from us, from the, let's say, Balkans or let's say maybe Southern countries or whatever, whatever you call it. So it's completely different, different situation. So it depends, a lot of depends on, on society and civil society is part of society. We should not forget that whatever we do as a human rights organization, that every report we are doing, every statement in media, whatever we do have to some extent uh, impact on society. And that we create some kind of some kind of opinion changing, or we are part of democracy, as you want, because we influence some opinions and so on. So we cannot say that we are completely neutral and independent and, and so on. So this is this is just we should we should get rid of those idealistic uh, idealistic pictures. But I think at the end that organization must stay away from the politics because they will either become uh, gongos like governmental control organization. Sometimes they can be politically connected to organization, which is quite often some political parties create organization or uh, can be connected to commercial interest. I must say that in, in ideal societies, uh, being connected to the political parties is not necessarily something bad. You have many organizations in, let's say, in, in uh, EU, that are connected to some political parties in one society. And that's not necessarily bad. They are doing sometimes even, even good work supporting partners uh, somewhere, somewhere abroad. And uh, that's not necessarily bad. But we, you, it's always, it's, we always need to be careful if organization is independent, uh, is independent or not. And why, again, we should not, again, be disconnected? Because the whole story Citizens in, the, in democracy, citizens participate in political life. So the whole point is that we have as much participation of citizens in political life as possible. And civil society actors are just group of citizens, nothing else. So this is, this is it. And human rights organizations are group of citizens who advocate human rights and who monitor human rights and who are insisting that human rights standards are implemented. So we cannot be just like that independent superficially and saying that we are not part of society because we are, and there is a lot of interconnection with the political, with the political life. Uh, to be honest, in, uh, I'm coming from Serbia and sometimes when we are lobbying for some laws, we don't know what position of political parties will be. We often have no idea how political, what position will different political parties have. We know for the, this extreme right political parties that they will probably be negative, but all others, including a uh, ruling party that has like almost 200 seats in, uh, in the parliament out of 250, so they are predominantly uh, uh, in, the, in the parliament. Uh, we don't know, we don't have idea uh, how they will vote and if they will support adoption of some measure, adoption of some policy, or adopt, adoption of some law. So it is, this question is really tricky. It's not that simple question, but I must say that we should stay away from the politics, but we should be realistic that our, that our influence on the, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, civic life and the political life, let's say in one society, is, exists. So this is some kind of my conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think in the literature of political science, this is uh, 
defined as the difference between the political uh, sphere and political activities, because not all political activities uh, might necessarily have a political aim. Okay, with that, I will turn to Ferai and ask the same question again, please answer in line with your experiences. This tension, you're right in the middle of that tension, by the way, in Turkey, because your platform is dealing with the state, the relevant government uh, institutions uh, working in the fields of human rights, you are in close contact with them. So you are in the middle of a very serious tension over there. So how do you uh, deal with that? What are the problems that you are facing? Well, of course, at this point in time, I can say uh, that when we look at the 2005 period, all the way up to the 2009 period where we uh, challenged everyone to have closer consultations and those who had the capacity to change certain things, we tried to develop tools and instruments to be effective on those institutions because the main issue is all about to which institution we are approaching and on behalf of which group. This is very important. You may be approaching a certain institution on behalf of the refugees, for instance. It might be an issue about the refugees that we are dealing with, with the ruling uh, party. Or we want to ask the ruling party to uh, cancel a certain practice regarding refugees. We need to be able to know uh, where we can come to an agreement and where we cannot come to an agreement. So. The individuals that we are defending or advocating for uh, are important uh, in terms of overcoming the challenges in your approach. Uh, since the beginning, since our establishment actually, what we have been doing is to uh, work for the establishment of a national human rights institution. Yes, it's a public institution uh, within the public administration, but in terms of human rights and freedoms, it should be an independent institution, an independent structure. We really worked hard for that. And in that uh, struggle, in that effort, that there were many failures, of course, and then there were uh, minor changes, but now at this point in time, we no longer have such relations with the public authorities. Of course, we go to the parliament to uh, voice our demands and with all the political parties, well, I cannot say all because we are not dealing that much with a party that defends racism, actually. This is right against our values, right? So, of course, there is no such thing as you cannot negotiate or have talks uh, with the ruling party. No, your relations with the ruling party or all political parties for that purpose uh, is it for the purpose of showing them what is right or is it for the purpose of working on uh, gender equality within political parties? For instance, imagine a party that has approved equality and the women, uh, women's organizations might be working with that political party. Is it considered as uh, agreeing with that ideology? No. I think what you are doing is important and why you are doing it is important. Why are you having uh, a contact with the political uh, party? Uh, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's a negative uh, thing. We now need to have a certain map in front of us. In that map, we need to able to see that currently the public administration with the changing regime, with the changing constitution, and I don't even know what that regime is called, but with that uh, strongman regime, let's say, one person in power, holding all the power, all the resources, deciding on everything, not listening to anybody else. That's, of course, in such an environment, you cannot have any relationship 
uh, or a mutual relationship with the political parties. And I think we're uh, exactly sitting at that crossroads. And when we say political parties, well, can they not establish associations for their own ideologies? Yes, we have examples of such uh, organizations established in Germany and other countries. But to what extent does this contribute to the social space is a totally different discussion than the human rights movement. But the civil uh, space, uh, the civic space, is different. When we look at the civic space in Turkey, we're also talking about communities, religious communities, right? Are we going to neglect them, religious communities? No, we cannot. So looking at them and the things that they defend, advocate for, some of them are supporting the government, some of them are not. So this is a huge space when we uh, say the civil uh, space. Turkey is a big country, but looking from the uh, perspective of the human rights organizations, we can say that human rights organizations are independent. They uh, uphold the uh, values of human rights uh, to protect the human dignity for everyone. So for this to happen, they can also send representatives to political parties to influence political parties as well. And it means that that civil society organization is not uh, connected to that political party. No, it doesn't mean that. But when we look at the policies, we see that every statement we make is continuously referenced by someone, oh, that is a reference to that political party, that is a reference to that political party. There is always in the background a discourse, a narrative uh, imposed upon us, uh, which also marginalize us. Uh, it's a tool uh, that actually tries to correlate us with certain political parties when we talk about the civil society organizations participating in the civil society. Of course, we're trying to shape the politics uh, in a way uh, that uh, it will be promoting human rights and freedoms, but it doesn't make us uh, a pawn for uh, or the backyard for that political party. It never means that. So it's actually a very difficult. It's, it's very valuable, but it's also very uh, difficult. That autonomous uh, space, keeping, preserving that autonomous space is very important. Who you are advocating for, why are you having that advocacy, to what purpose we need to increase the uh, environments uh, to be able to do that. That's all I can say. Okay, thank you so much, Ferai. I think with your last uh, comments, you have uh, answered some of the questions that we received in the chat box. Both uh, you and uh, Goran, you have answered some of the questions. Uh, I will turn to go around as well. So we have about 20 minutes left, right, Ebru? Am I right? We will be wrapping up at 8, Turkish time. So I think Hakan Tahmas, let me greet him by the way. I think Hakan Tahmas has a question to Metin Bakalcı. He says, if you reduced human rights violations to only state violations, wouldn't it be narrowing down the problem and avoiding a social uh, solution with a social impact? Well, this is a question that we get very often. Uh, sometimes the governments, the states, They also ask non-state actors in Turkey. The state asks the non-state actors, why are you are you not dealing with human rights violations? So, by the way, let me also greet my friend Hakan. Greet my friend Hakan. So, 
I would like to continue in the format of a normal meeting in giving my response. The first point I'd like to make is the issue of human rights is under the uh, obligation of the state's governments. I'm not going to delve into a longer debate, but that's what I wanted to say briefly. That's the first point. The second point is I don't have a legal background, as you know. I'm uh, from the uh, health sector. We're talking about prevention of torture, but we all know we talk about humanitarian law. That is important. The third point, since 1991, in the field of human rights, the Oklahoma Declaration uh, is referred to regarding armed groups and this is carried to the agenda of the human rights organizations in conflict in areas of conflict to the extent possible uh, I should say in Turkish uh, Human Rights Foundation, in uh, Turkish uh, Doctors Association, well, regarding all the conflicting sites, parties, regarding the violations, I ha we have always made efforts to prevent the violations. And in the most recent conflict, Human Rights Foundation, Medical Association, the association, they uh, were the ones who went to the conflict zone in the first place in order to uh, identify the situation, take a picture, reveal the situation. And there are lots of international principles uh, we would like to follow, and we're trying to do this to the extent uh, possible. So it is obviously a responsibility of the states. And the protective actor is at the same time the one who may uh, commit the violence. It's a paradox, but the facto regimes, non-governmental organizations, well, I should say, I, I'm not just referring to ISIS and the likes. All across the globe, there are armed groups, and this area should also be looked at. Hakan, I don't want to take more time. That will be it for my response. But I'm also curious to hear your views on that, too. Thank you, Metin Bey. So there is a gray zone. Government-like agencies are also in the play in play and they grow in numbers. There's another question. This question to Mr. Miletic. I think this question was asked before and Ferai was trying to answer that. Uh, let me see if the speakers have something else to say. The question is about the political sphere. Some, some groups are not in the political sphere, but they conduct political activity. This is the topic of the question. And there is one other remark made. This is the following. Um, civil society should be located in the gray area between being political and being governmental. So they claim civil society is placed in the middle, in the gray area. Do you agree with this assessment regarding the gray area? I think I think we should first define, maybe we misunderstood or, or, or something, my, what, what I say. Uh, uh, politics is, uh, is still, as far as I know, definition of political parties is still that those are the organization who are participating in elections and wants to become part of power. Even small, very, very small political party is going to elections and want to one day to participate in power, in executive branch. That's the still definition of political party. While 
civil society organizations are not doing that. They are representing, uh, they are representing citizens. They are group that are that are that are uh, in one association because of some reason. Those reasons could be really different. It could be some agricultural association, but it's still you know it's different, completely different reasons. So there is a different perspectives, and we are not going. My organization will not go to elections in, in Sweden. However, uh, uh, there is in these questions that I see it translated here, it, it says like uh, that we are uh, uh, we are criticizing what is what is uh, what is done by uh, by state. Yes, but that's not politics. When we are criticizing, we are saying if human rights standards are are violated, that's power. So we are we are assessing if executive branch is doing things properly or not, is judiciary is doing things wrong, good or, or not, or, 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 uh, or, or wrong. So we are commenting that and calling authorities to change that. On top of it, we are calling parliament to adopt some measures, including a law that will prevent some bad, bad situations in the future. That's one part of the things, and that's not politics. That we are saying what are the standards and what should be done in one country, or on international level. That's one part of the story. Another part of the story that what we are doing is with some so-called non-state actors. For example, what we are doing, we are finding that some paramilitaries did killings in Bosnia. So they are paramilitaries. They are not part of the state, but we are finding that they committed war crimes and we are, what we are doing, we are criticizing government that didn't arrest perpetrators and didn't brought them to the justice. So we are, we are doing, uh, this is all the time advocacy, lobbying, we are helping citizens, representing victims and so on. But that's not the politics. We are in our work, we are not aiming to become a power to become uh, 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 members of the parliament and so on. So we are very, very limited to the uh, to the, our work and, and, and standards and so on. Of course, as I mentioned in my, my speech, there are some organizations in many countries, including in Sweden, that are close to one particular political party. Of course, this exists in some countries, but in general, this is not, or human rights organizations should not be a part of political, uh, should not be part of political sphere. There is many, many other organizations uh, in each society that are maybe more closer uh, uh, to politics, but I'm not, uh, I don't think so that human rights, that we, I think that human rights organizations will lose credibility if they are uh, a part of, if they, for example, participate in elections. So. This is this is what I was why I stay say that we should stay away of, of politics in my country in Serbia or in the Balkans. There is a, in some elections there are situations when organizations uh, uh, support some political option openly, or some uh, human rights leaders go on TV and say, okay, I'm supporting these political political options. And there is a very big debate: should we do this, or maybe we should not do this. Is this person is losing credibility in one hand if you're supporting some political leader or, you know, or, or this is completely okay because some people say, well, this is his private or, or her private uh, uh, sphere. I don't think so. If I'm quite visible in Serbia all the time in media and I'm going tomorrow and support uh, a politi any political party, that I can disconnect that from my human rights work. I think it will be very, very hard very hard if I'm going and doing vocal. But that's maybe my, my personal opinion. We are not, as a, here in Sweden, we are not participating, you know, in elections or saying any opinion about political party. We can criticize, we can sit with them on a on table when they demand, to, uh, when we demand them to adopt some law, but that's it. That's it. But we are not participating in politics in way of elections and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much for this explanation. Maybe we can deduce the following message. At work, those civil society organizations working in the field of human rights are not acting to gain power, to be in power, but they are trying to influence those who hold the power, maybe. That's how we can wrap this up. 
It could be considered as a political activity, but the aim is not to come in power or gain power in that sense. Erayanam, I'd like to turn to you. There is a question that we want to uh, refer to you. You have a human rights background and you represent the uh, members, the initiatives within the scope of your joint platform. Here's the question. Uh, the representative from the Violence Free Society Association, uh, there is the question. The voluntary participation in the civil society is not strong, and this is a shortcoming. This is not a shortcoming specifically about Turkey. Many countries have that, especially in the fields uh, in the field of human rights. Voluntary participation is not very high. This was the first question, the first remark. And the second one is the following. Civil society work, whether it's a professional uh, activity or not, if this is considered as a professional activity, do you think this would hamper the spirit of human rights activities? Voluntariness and participation, uh, how they are defined is important. Metin was talking about the establishment of Human Rights Foundation in Turkey. He also explained the process and referred to the uh, contribution of the health professionals and the lawyers and how they fought against torture. Voluntariness lies at the core of that, of that effort. Uh, in the Human Rights Association, that it has a presence in many cities at local level in Turkey, and they have a high voluntariness uh, level. It's quite strong. I think voluntarism has a different presence in big cities. Well, we can't talk about the voluntariness policy. By the way, I strongly recommend all of us, all of you, to go ahead and check the definition of the voluntarism. In the development plan, there is a reference to strengthening voluntarism. There is such a headline. I don't know why, but this sounds as threatening to me somehow. Strategic planning, that used to be state planning organization in Turkey, is a uh, uh, behind that, well, I was saying, when we talk about voluntary participation, it could manifest itself in different shapes and forms. It could be a donation, it could be uh, personally going to places, doing physically things, or it could be sending out a social media message. It could be in different forms and shapes. It's not something easy to measure, voluntariness. It doesn't have to be something physical. Not, uh, it doesn't have to be a person physically coming to the headquarters and doing something. I think there are less and less people who uh, personally come and want to do something physically. Well, this is this should be understood well. For example, all the environmental movements are based on voluntariness. In FATSA, there was this gold mine issue, and people were manifesting about that. And I think it is completely voluntariness, those people going and displaying civilian disobedience for the sake of environment, that was also voluntariness. It doesn't have to be a physical production. 
one needs to look at the conditions of voluntariness. People come and put forward efforts. It doesn't have to be a financial uh, contribution. It also has to do with internal relations. It's a two-way relationship. There are dark clouds around organizations. There is this threatening atmosphere. And there is a very negative uh, perception sometimes, uh, unfortunately, around such organizations because some political leaders publicly making negative statements against our organizations. Well, how come can you easily find new volunteers? People feel threatened. That is one. Secondly, our country is becoming poorer and poorer. Poverty is increasing. And there's a big issue of unemployment. Very big. These all influence the level of volunteering. If one has a long-term goal and a vision, of course, uh, people should be making efforts for that. And there is a, of course, it's important how you uh, strike a balance between volunteerism and professionalism. This cannot be a profession. Uh, civil society work, well, it can't be a profession per se. For example, in environmental impact assessment, you could work as an impact assessor. Yes, uh, you could do that as a voluntary person, or you could deliver that service professionally. You could be paid for that. That's something else. So NGOs should have a policy about that. There is a distinction between professionalism and voluntarism. Sometimes the line is blurred, but there should be a line, and that requires a policy uh, among the NGOs. By the way, if you consider volunteers as slaves, how come can you expect those people to continue to come and help you? Well, that's not going to be sustainable. By the way, most women associations, women organizations work on the shoulders of volunteers, mostly. And these days, uh, they have very much resonating campaigns nation, nationwide, all across Anatolia, and they're mostly they're voluntary people. These organizations that conduct projects that are given uh, donations and funds, well, you these people are not professionals. They're not making their lives out of that. That's not what they why they're doing this. So volunteerism is important. These are important concepts. And the, these co any confusion regarding these concepts shouldn't cause a fog that would reduce our visibility regarding the main issue. What I suggest is the following. I have been thinking about this panel for the past two days, and I have been thinking about ourselves for quite a long time. Can, can I have two more minutes? Sure. So one. The government imposes this association's law, a giant bureaucracy, and it seems as if we accepted that we should be objecting that we should be debating on our own issues. We should be deciding on what to discuss. How can we define voluntarism? What is professionalism? And well, by the way, representation, well, we don't represent anybody. We are intermediaries of those who should be represented. 
And we should be able to do that and discuss that by way of boards that we will form ourselves. Whereas now the law imposes us uh, what we need to do, how we need to do that. We should be objecting that. We should be raising an objection about this. Thank you so much for your insights. Well, this issue is not usually well understood by some, and that's important. Voluntary participation, especially in the field of environment, women works, well, uh, these are usually conducted thanks to voluntarism. Also, human rights movement, likewise. People who share certain opinion uh, come together. We also talk about a narrow scale civil society organizations, but we also talk about movements, larger scale movements. This is also true for political parties. I mean, the workers for a political party is one thing, whereas the supporters of that political party, that's a different thing. There's a distinction. Well, we had three valuable speakers, and we are grateful for uh, them. They gave us two valuable hours, and they were generous with us in sharing their experience and insights. And I believe the audience uh, will leave this session quite satisfied. And personally, and I find I found this very enriching. And before we bring this to an end, I'd like to thank Metin Bakkalcı, Mr. Miletic, and Feray Salman. Thank you all so much. And I would like to thank Huran Think Foundation for this wonderful organization. And I would like to thank our interpreters. We had four interpreters today. I hope I'm not wrong. Yes, as far as I know, we had four interpreters, and we would like to thank them all for the excellent interpretation. Although the speakers were uh, speaking fast, they did a good job. And I want to hand it over to Merve Nebiolo. She will be informing us about the coming uh, sessions. Thank you all so much for your participation. Uh, please share with us the three ideas you will leave this session with, take away ideas, and please continue to follow us for the coming events, and remember to fill in the evaluation form. That will be very valuable feedback for us. On April 21st, we will have our next session to start at 6 o'clock. This will be about identities, values, and social benefits. That will be the topic of the session. We will have a guest from Germany, Kida, Emrah Gürsel, from Chaos GL, Yildiz Tar, and Education Reform Initiative, Ushuk Tuzun, and Ferhat Kentar will be joining us. Ayşe Kürsepadur will be the moderator of the session, the next session. Thank you all so much, and we would like to thank the interpreters too. I was following the English version. That was very good. Thank you so much.